and welcome back to the podcast. I'm the host, Sean Boyce. I'd like to welcome my guest and friend to the show today, Rob Nixon. Hello, Rob. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here coming from Australia. Welcome. Uh, we're very excited about that. I have lots of questions, uh, including, Rob, you have a new report um, that's come out very recently that we have lots of questions about. And we're very excited to learn more about that. But before we dive in, if you wouldn't mind, can you give our listeners more information about your background and how you got to be doing the work that you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm 52 years old and 28 years ago, uh, May 1994, uh, I was running a series of seminars on customer service for general business. Anyway, an accountant turned up one day. Uh, his name was Ellis Ryan. And Ellis said, will you come and do this for my clients in my town? And it was a small customer service seminar. I said, sure. And I was uh, 24 years old at the time. And I said, where are you from? And he told me the location, which I knew where it was. And his town was 3,500 people. I said, okay, uh, how many clients do you have? He said, 126. I said, great, here's how it's going to work. We'll invite them to the services club. Uh, I'll present the seminar. I'll take all the risk and uh, take any profits. You'll be seen as the hero. 56 people turn up, my biggest one ever, right? And I thought, these accountants are amazing. They can fill a room. I can't. I'm going to target accountants. So uh, that started the journey. Uh, the Very seminar cool. business, it's a bad business. So I got out of that. Um, I actually took a job later that year for a company that um, uh, flew me all around the world, being a trainer for accountants. Uh, that company got sold in 2000. I started my own company. And in 2001, I actually did a benchmark report uh, so my, my career has always been accountants as clients. I'm not an accountant myself, uh, but I did a benchmark report in 2001 called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of the Accounting Profession in Australia. And it was a hit. Um, I sold out of that company four years later. It was the software company. And anyway, um, that particular report still exists today. And uh, so over the years, um, you know, went from being a trainer of accountants to owning a software company. Then I started coaching accounting firms in 2005. Uh, and all these years later, I uh, decided uh, four years ago to channel my energies to the USA and uh, Canadian market. And so that's where, so I'm coaching accounting firms on peak performance, on financial performance. Um, and last year, uh, I hadn't done the benchmark report, financial benchmark report in the US before. And last year, I was in an accident, actually, in the hospital for a while. And I thought, why am I doing this in the US? I should do this. In the I know how to do this. I'll do it in the US. So that was September. The, the seeds were sown. Um, and we decided to do it. It's been a hit. Uh, we released it literally 10, 10 days ago, I think. Um, it's been amazing. The feedback's been amazing. Uh, we did a launch webinar. And it's all about uh, this benchmark report. It's all about, so what makes a great firm great? What are the key metrics? Uh, what are the things, what are the levers to pull? Uh, so based on 28 years of experience, I've peppered it with um, some advice in there as well. Uh, and it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's very proud of it. Fantastic. And I listened to your webinar when I was very excited to see the latest report, to consume it. I listened to the webinar, which I had a week or two ago from now, and uh, it was incredible. And I mean, there was just so much amazing value. I've read the report since. I can't say enough good things about it. We're going to talk a lot about it in this episode. And I would highly encourage anyone who's listening to get a copy of this report. There is so much valuable information and it's ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Rob, and, 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 uh, much uh, appreciated. And we give it away for free. So this is a give back. Um, we make no money from that. We don't want to make any money from it. It's a free give. Um, so your listeners can get it from Rob, robnixon.com. Um, it's on the front page there, R-O-B-N-I-X-O-N.com. So yeah. Um, Amazing. Thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah. Before we get into talking about the detail in the report, which I'm very excited to do with you, I want to talk a little bit more about something we've talked about before. Obviously, you spend quite a bit of time in Australia. You've talked a lot about the work that you've done there. We, now you're talking about um, the studying that you've done and the research in terms of the US. And we know there's differences between these markets. We've talked about this before. Um, there's a lot of data to suggest that the Australian market has actually quite a far bit ahead of the North American market as it pertains to the accounting industry. Can you talk about that a little bit uh, before we dive into the report? Because uh, a lot of this information in many ways, I think for the industry, especially for North America, feels like it may be somewhat coming from the future. It's quite a bit of uh, what to expect or what's ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So in Australia, being a small country for decades, there have been educators of the accounting profession. And to educate the entire market in Australia, you can do a seminar tour, for example, and do six cities and you cover 
80% of the market, 90% of the market. So for decades, various educators, I have been one, um, uh, coaches, trainers, consultants have been doing seminar roadshows to the profession on practice management, right? How to run your accounting firm. Um, the technology piece on top of that, again, with the technology companies, they can infiltrate the market very, very quickly because we're so uh, populated in six cities, right? So, so that's the background as to why the Australian accounting profession is about five to seven years ahead of the USA profession in the way they run their firms and the technology usage in their firm and the, um, the, uh, the, the business community that the accounting profession serves. In the US, there's 72 cities above 500,000 people, right? So consequently, all of the educators, coaches, consultants, trainers to the US profession have been very localized in their um, reach, right? Now, webinars, of course, allow you to get a bigger reach, but essentially the, the profession has been better educated in Australia over a longer period of time. So consequently, they run their businesses differently and better. Some examples. Um, <laughs> you, you would think if you looked at an Australian accounting firm that the accountants are lazy because they only work 37 and a half hours a week and for 45 weeks of the year. The standard working year is 1,687 hours, right? That's it. You know, so you, 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 read, you will never get an accountant working on a Saturday or a Sunday. Uh, five o'clock on a Friday, they've checked out. They're gone. Uh, they close for literally three to four weeks over Christmas and New Year. And you just can't get one. And so consequently, there hasn't been a focus on time, right, on labour. It's been a focus on margin, and the accounting profession in Australia uh, has a bigger margin of, of um, average hourly rate because they're not focused on time. The US profession has just been a workhorse, right? It just works and works and works and works and pushes the hours out and just does so many hours. It's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous, right? Um, <laughs> so, and, and, and it seems it's just been a a big labor for hire model in the United States. Yep. You know, let's get more labor, let's get more labor because we need to churn out more hours, right? Yep. And that, that to me is the biggest change. The technology piece, because again of the education of the market, the cloud accounting and cloud practice management systems infiltrated our market 10 years ago, right? Yep. Cloud happened. I remember in 2013, I was running a seminar tour in Australia called Capitalising on the Cloud, right? How to use this technology to build a better accounting business and a better help your clients more. That discussion doesn't happen anymore, right? It, it stopped, the discussion stopped five or six years ago. You know, it happened. The infiltration of the technology, you know, all of the hosting companies, for example, hosting is still a big thing in the US. The hosting companies, they're gone. They, they, they cease to exist. So, but the hosting companies still exist in the United States because the technology used at the at the firm end and the business end is still, in some respects, archaic technology. So, and this causes inefficiencies and more labor needed in in, in the firm. So, there's a couple of big changes, but the background is education. Super well said, Rob. Thank you very much for that summary and for all of us this year. And I wanted to make sure that you were well aware of that. Uh, Rob, you've led a charge in a major way in that being on the forefront for a very long time in terms of pushing the industry forward and just some of the dramatic differences between the industry the industry in Australia and the industry in North America and other markets as well. Also, I want to make sure that listeners are well aware of that because that's going to reflect as well also. Um, and there's just absolutely so much to learn, right? So much, so much progressive accounting technology and a lot of progress comes from Australia, as well as what the firms there have adopted in terms of just how dramatically different the markets are between there and the North America and markets like that. So thank you for sharing that piece as well, too. There's a lot more to dive in on that. I know you have a lot of content on that. I talk about it as well also. So um, something else to take away from this episode as well also. Now, uh, without further ado, let's get into the report. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, Rob, can you give us kind of a, an overview of the substance in the report, uh, description, if you will, uh, some things where people can kind of learn more about what's in there, what they'll find in the report. Uh, then we can kind of go into the findings as well too. 
Absolutely. So um, the way that it was done is we have accounting firms submit their financial data for 2021, right? And, and also not just financial data, but some uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, questions that gave us um, some, um, you know, so, some answers to, to things that we didn't know. Uh, one of them was quite, a couple were quite surprising. Um, one of them was the profit per partner. Uh, I thought it would come in at about $100,000 less. Now, granted, often with benchmark reports, the more progressive firms go in them, right? So, yep. so sometimes the numbers are a bit skewed up um, and a profit per partner was 400, the median result, right in the middle, right? The median result was $421,000. Now, these firms ranged from uh, a million to 10 in size. So uh, often in small firms under a mill, they can be skewed very easily for profit because the practitioner, the owner is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So I wanted to get um, a sample size between a mill and 10, which we got. And so first thing was um, profit per partner was 421, median result. Highest result was just over 2.1 million uh, from a sole practitioner in Florida. Um, and many firms were much higher, of course, because right in the middle was 421. So half of them were much higher than 421, half of them were lower. Um, and and that was quite surprising. I thought it'd come in about 350 or 330, 350. Um, but I do think that was also propped up by the employee retention credits uh, last year. Uh, there's a lot of revenue from that and the year before the PPP loans. So a lot of government incentive programs were propping up um, profitability, right? Because a lot of firms... With the ERC um, uh, program, they were charging a value-based fee, percentage of money back, et cetera. So, um, so mind you, in every year, there's always special projects, M&A work, or you know, other consulting projects as well, which can prop up profitability. So, so that was a big surprise. Um, with my comment regarding progressive firms, I was surprised at the median result of cloud accounting in their client base, which was 29%. I thought that would be much lower as well. And I don't think cloud has happened, but it sort of has in the US. Um, when I say that, it, it's still, we've still got the hosting companies flying around. We've still got a lot of people on QuickBooks desktop um, that won't budge or don't budge. But that that was actually quite surprising as well. I thought it'd be a lot lower um, than, than, than what it was. So yeah, the the, the results were, were awesome. Um, it was great to have we had 267 firms um, initially participate in this. So that was a good sample size. Uh, we did kick out quite a few because some of the data was so skewed that it just didn't make sense. Um, that was, was one. Uh, talking about data, one of big, my big surprises was how many firms who submitted the data didn't know their numbers. Right, they didn't. They were giving round figures, and I had to go back. I spent three months going backwards and forwards with so many. No, that number doesn't look right. Wow. Tell me the real number, because you know, a bit like an accountant looking at a profit, loss, and balance sheet, they can pick up anomalies really fast, right? Because yep. I've been doing this for so long, I can pick up right. That number is wrong, right? It just doesn't compute. Um, and so, not knowing the numbers, um, client numbers. There were so many they didn't know how many clients they had. Um, which was That's surprising. Yeah. I'm, I'm laughing at the uh, the irony of the accounting firms not knowing their numbers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Pretty interesting, right? Uh, I saw that in the report, and that was definitely something I wanted to ask you about because that's been partially my experience as well also, is accounting firms not knowing their numbers and not knowing necessarily how they're going to be able to get them. Uh, what type of experiences did you have in this area? And um, did you find, you know, what did you find the most startling or the most shocking about this? Uh, so, first of all, they know some numbers. They definitely know revenue. They know expenses, of course, salaries. Um, uh, they know those numbers. But the, the big one, which I push, is what I call profit time index. And profit time index is the ultimate outcome number. It's a number that with everything you do in your firm, all, all um, projects, strategies, method of running your firm leads to this one number. And the one number is um, profit before partner salaries divided by partners working in hours. So working in the business versus on the business. Yep. And working in the business um, is client work charged or not charged, review work of team members, firm administration. You're doing what the business does, right? Yep. Versus yep. 
working on the business, growing, developing the business. So sales, marketing, uh, product development, things that get leveraged. And so, so that number, uh, they may know how many client delivery hours the partner spent, uh, but they didn't know, well, how many extra hours on top of that? So there was a lot of guessing around that one. Um, some of the firms we coach measure that every month because if you are, you know, I believe that a partner in an accounting firm should make a lot of money and have a lot of time, right? So time at both, 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 both things because partners in accounting firms just don't, and the whole firm, just doesn't charge enough for what they do because they're so smart, they add so much value, they just don't charge enough. So, and they work too hard, as I said before, they work way too many hours, right? So if we had to put a strategy in place to get more leverage, to get more profitability, to reduce our time, then this number pops out the end as profit time index. And the top mark was 2076. Uh, the bottom was like $40 or something, some crazy numbers. Um, wow. And yeah, which is basically you're working your, your guts out doing making no money, right? So, so making money, but it's all yep. based on high, high labor. Yeah. Right, right, right. You're just eating away like that. Uh, super interesting. Yeah, the knowing the numbers is particularly concerning, I would say, uh, for firms that may be listening to this episode that are thinking, oh boy, I'm not sure whether or not I know my numbers. What numbers would you share for them, Rob, in terms of these are these are the numbers you need to focus on, you need to know these, as in, uh, if they don't know them, they could start thinking about what they need to do in order to figure that out. Yeah, so let me, so if, if, if profit time index is an output number, Right, so that is uh, with everything you do. The most important number to look at on a weekly basis is average hourly rate, is margin. So this is uh, the revenue for the week or the month, the period, uh, divided by the client charged hours. So I'm a big believer in keeping timesheets, but ditching hourly rates, right? Uh, firms, um, and I am generalizing here, the vast majority of firms that ditch timesheets have zero timesheets, um, are not run as well because a lot of their metrics go out the door. So let's get let's keep the timesheet, but get rid of the hourly rates attached to them and go to one dollar an hour, right? So so that means that we can measure efficiencies, we can measure our margin, we can measure throughput because we've got time on it, and the number is average hourly rate. And so average hourly rate, um, you know, we need to measure it four ways, right? First of all, uh, for the period, you know, so the week or the month. Uh, second of all. The, uh, the, the person, right? So some people are more efficient. If you've got a fixed price than others, they're going to have a higher average hourly rate. Third is the product. So what products yield a bigger margin? And the fourth one, which is the most surprising of them all when you do the exercise is the, is the client. So how you do this, Sean, is you get a spreadsheet, a simple spreadsheet, four columns, dump all your clients into column A, client name. Column B is going to be the revenue you got from that client last year. Column C is hours taken for that client. And then B and C will give you the average hourly rate per client. And so that'll be, you know, you might be 150 for the whole firm, but there'll be a massive spread depending on the client. And, and, lot, and what the, the surprising thing is when, when you do this first up, a lot of high value, like 40, 50, $60,000 clients to the firm have a low average hourly rate. Mm. So, and this is the average, so half above, half below, of course. So, so we get our firms to measure this um, uh, weekly. Uh, the top producing firm of this number was $377, a firm in Kentucky, which we've coached for the last four years. Uh, interesting, the firm in Kentucky, uh, their pro productivity, so hours um, or utilization, was only 50%. Which is beautiful, right? It's amazing. Because yeah, it's, <laughs> it's beautiful that they're making lots of money, but yep. they're not not doing lots of time. I was just going to say so, that. So they've got time to have a four day work week. They've got time off throughout the year. They've got you know it's more of a relaxed firm. Yep. Clients are still getting served, but there's not no stress because they're, amazing. Because we taught them this um, four years ago. This firm in Kentucky. If we focus on average hourly rate and drive that number, and there's many ways to drive the number then we can don't have to spend all the time. Instead that's of the other so way around, let's drive the time and not focus on that number. So, and, and that's been a big one where the, the profession has not focused on that number by period, mm -hmm. by client, by product, by person. Super well said. And it sounds like that firm, unlike most firms, 
have achieved progress in both of those fronts as opposed to most firms haven't made progress on either, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, they make, they, make, they, make, they, make, they make progress on hours taken, but it's the wrong progress, right? It's too many. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Go in the opposite direction. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Uh, something else I noticed in the report as well, too, which is a finding, and I know that there's a big discrepancy, a big difference here in the markets as well, also is uh, one of the findings that you had in the report that said charging by the hour hurts. Uh, I wanted you to dive into this one a little bit more if you can, because this is an area that I talked about a lot as well also. And I'm um, curious to know more about what you found in the report um, and what you mean by kind of that, that statement. Yeah. So we asked three questions. What percentage of your revenue is charged by the hour in arrears? What percentage of your revenue is a fixed fee for the project? Uh, what percentage of your revenue is fixed monthly recurring revenue? So pure MRR, right? Yep. So with that, uh, we could find out and slice and dice the data and put, okay, what's the percentages of high, um, what, what I was looking for, but it's the first time I've actually ever done it. What was the percentage of profitability and profit per partner vis-a-vis how much was charged by the hour in arrears, right? Mm-hmm. Because... I've always educated that it's a bad way to do it. You know, time-based billing in arrears, um, which is a, a method developed in 1919 by a guy called Reginald Herbert Smith, right? So, so this is a system that still exists today. The problem with it is that it is time taken, times rate, less write-offs equals price. It assumes that the time taken was correct. It assumes that the uh, rate per hour of the person or the team was correct. It assumes that you thought you'd write some off and get the price, right? And the rate per hour, of course, is typically derived by the the person's salary divided by their worked hours, call it 2,000, equals 40 bucks, times a factor of three or four, and there's the charge rate. And then as the salaries go up, the charge rates go up. And then, you know, what happens if you do it in arrears, the more efficient you get with the time, the price goes down. Right, and we've seen this with, which is which is crazy, right? It's just really yep. bizarre. We saw that we saw this in New Zealand when cloud um, technology came about. Um, they weren't pricing in advance, as in fixed fee. Uh, they got about fifty percent, fifty percent more efficient, and the profitability of the profession went down, right? Visibly inflation, right? So, yep. so it's just a crazy way. It's an hours focused way to do it. So anyway, we found this firm in South in um, uh, Southampton in the Hamptons, right? And they were like 8% profit, uh, 20 people doing $2.5 million in revenue, 95%, sorry, 100% was charged by the hour, but 95% was priced in arrears and 5% was still priced um, by the hour, but priced in advance. So basically 100% thought process by the hour. And of course, you get, a, and there's many other firms like this, I just picked on this particular one in the case study. Um, the profitability was 8% because there was so much labor in the business, 20 people doing the work, and they weren't focused on, on the right numbers. So mm. it ju- it's just a crazy way. To, the, the best method is either, uh, and typically about 80%, 20% on this one, getting your revenue, the known revenue for the known work and the known entities to a monthly fixed fee, Right. Mm. So it's a 12 grand client, it's a grand a month. And you bundle in um, ad hoc uh, phone calls, emails, meetings, advice, and you come up with a monthly fixed fee price. Um, Then you are incentivized because that's the price, it's better for the client, for their cash flow, better for yours. Definitely. Uh, Evens out the lumps. Um, We move every firm to this um, uh, that we we work with. It's better all around. And then we focus on, and uh, so that's 80% of revenue, 20% of revenue or thereabouts, on for the project, a singular project, a fixed fee that the client signs off on, right? So it could be a, a consulting project or like these ERC things or PPP loans. Um, you know, that project is signed off by the client. They've signed off on the monthly fixed fee. Fixed fee, done. Now the firm is incentivized to employ efficiency technologies to get as efficient as possible exactly. and reduce the time, whether that be technology, better workflow methods, different people on the job. You know, let's focus on not more time, but less time. So, so that number, average hourly rate, has got, and, and the way that you price it uh, and, and the project has got a knock-on effect all the way through the firm. So the number one project 
that other than the num- number one number of average hourly rate, the number one project we get every firm to do is switch from hours and arrears to a fixed fee in advance, ideally by the month. Love it. Love it from the perspective of the consumer. And I'm talking about that all the time. Uh, in terms of what I've switched from accounting firm myself as a consumer. In fact, Rob, I'm starting to think that next time I need to do that, I need to talk to you first. <laughs> yeah, I'll, <laughs> because... I'll point you to, I'll point you to my <laughs> I'm always looking for that fixed fee to deliver a successful outcome, right? The, it's yeah. not about the output. It's about that outcome, right? That's what the clients are looking for. And still, there's just not a lot of alignment in the industry there, surprisingly so, despite there's all of this data in the form of your report and the success record uh, that the clients that you've worked with have had in terms of the progress they've been able to achieve because of it. So, uh, man, I hope we start to see a lot more of that, especially in the American market, which leads me to my next question. Based on the data that you found in, in this report and the studying that you've done and the work that you've done elsewhere in industry, where where do uh, firms in the North American market still have most of the progress yet to make? What what should they be focusing on now? Like what what should be their staples? What type of foundation should they have in place? And if they don't, what is what are the top things they need to start taking a closer look at first? Yeah, sure. So, so definitely, um, as we go back to the start of the conversation on time, is efficiency, right? So, I find the North American market inefficient at the way they do client work, right? Um, so, we talked about fixed pricing, which is a, up there as well, um, and getting to the price is a different topic, art and science. But just efficiency, you know, it's always been uh, let's get more accountants to do more accounting work. Many years ago in Australia, I invented a, a, a title and a role within an accounting firm um, called a client service assistant. Then we changed it to client service coordinator. Four years ago, we changed the title to client excellence coordinator. We've got a firm in Seattle, I coach. They call theirs their client concierge. It's the same, whatever you want to call it, right? It's basically administrators for the accounting team. Because accountants, we love accountants. They spend up to three hours, typically average of two, per accountant per day doing administrative work associated with the accounting work, doing a lot of admin work, right? Yep. And and by hiring different people, and often charged, right? So we hire, let's say, a ratio of four to one um, of administrators, right? So four to one, so four accountants, one administrator, to alleviate that two hours, and it's still chargeable typically, which frees up more capacity and we're able to get more faster throughput because we have a different, not just different people on the job doing the administrative tasks associated with the accounting work, but we also have a better workflow process to speed up the whole thing, right? So so typically we can get up to 50, sometimes more percent reduction in time by restructuring the workflow process to get more efficient So which means you don't need as many accountants, which is a labor shortage of them as well, right? So it's got a massive knock-on effect um, to the firm. So I would say, but you've got to change the process, right? You've got to change the way that you do it. um, And and, and also you've got to refill that capacity if you're not going to reduce the headcount. You can grow your business dramatically. Um, And that, of course, has got a knock-on effect to revenue per person, you know, overall revenue, profitability, et cetera, et cetera. So, so number one to me, I look at the way that the work is done and there's just a better way to be more efficient, to need less people and less time on job. And that's why that Kentucky firm, 50% productive, but we're still pushing 45% margin and 377 an hour, right? So because we've got a better workflow process. So that would be number one. Fantastic. Sounds like the dream to me. Uh, especially yeah. speaking from the experience <laughs> where a lot of American firms are at the moment, uh, that is a very different situation than what I'm often hearing. So, fantastic advice as as usual. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate you being here and sharing the detail from your report. Uh, as I've said, it's incredible. Everybody really should get a copy of that as soon as possible and read through it cover to cover. There's just so much to learn in there, Rob. Thank you for your the work that you've done, uh, all the hard work that went into producing that report. Um, I've got a couple questions for you about anything else that you might like to share before we let you go. Uh, the first one is, uh, where can, are there any resources, you know, where, number one, where can people go to get access to this report in addition sure. to any other resources you might recommend where people can learn more about anything we may have talked about here or anything else that you feel is important where firms can learn more? Absolutely. So if you go to robnixon.com, R-O-B-N-I-X-O-N.com, and just go to resources, there's a bunch of free stuff on there. Uh, there's uh, my fourth book came out a couple of years back. Uh, you can get download a free copy of that called The Wealthy Accountant. 
Um, so that's about a 200 page book, proper book. Um, you can get that for free. There's a, um, a menu of services and price list you can get for free. So we had a um, hundred or so firms, I think it's hundred, I can't remember the exact number, but um, contribute, there's over a hundred, contribute what they charged for what products. There's about 400 different products listed. So that's there. Um, there's a, there's a other links to other tools there. And of course, the benchmark report is there as well. So that'd be the best resource. And we like to uh, give a lot of a lot away because we, we only can coach a limited amount per year. So we have a cap at 64 firms per year. Um, if you're interested in coaching, again, on the website, you can see that. Um, you need to be a minimum of a million dollars in revenue, no more than five partners. Uh, you need to be coachable and ambitious, right? Because we're going to drive you, we're going to push you, we're going to change things with you. Uh, we've got a small team that works with you. Um, so that. So because we're going to coach so many per year, um, that capacity gap, we give a lot of way to help smaller firms or larger firms as well. So that, that'd be the best resource, Sean. Amazing. Fantastic resources. Thank you for sharing those. Those will all be linked in the show notes as well, too. So for anybody listening in, if you want easy access to what Rob shared, feel free to check out the show notes where you can find out more. And then, Rob, I think you've shared this profile, but I want to ask one more time just to make sure that we get it. Who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Yeah, so just go to robnix.com. There's an apply button. There's a um, contact button or send me a direct email if you choose to, rob at robnixon.com, super simple. Um, but, um, you know, so we, we we say no to most firms in a coaching scenario um, because either they're too small, too big, or they're not ready. Um, so, but if, if you are, back to uh, criteria, if you are ambitious, you really want to drive the time and the money, right? not just the time or the money. I need to do both. If you're ambitious, uh, we like to get firms to a million dollars profit while they're working less than partners, million dollars profit per partner while working less than 500 client delivery hours. So we push the profitability and the time and we help you restructure the firm so you can do that. Um, so you need to be more than a million dollars now and no more than five partners. The reason for no more than five partners, Sean, is because most multi-partner firms above five partners of too many indecision makers, right? So they just don't make decisions. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> and it's just hard work, right? Like, like we want to yep. push you hard. We want to get things done, implement, implement, implement. And if you've got eight or 10 partners around a table, sorry. Um, it's we're messy not fast. <laughs> it's, just, it's just too slow. It's like a Super well gla- glacial turn of an iceberg, right? <laughs> <laughs> well said. Amazing, Rob. Well, thank you so much for being here, sharing your knowledge and experience with myself and our audience. There's, like I said, so much value of Rob's website and the work that he does. So consume it, uh, get access to it, learn from it, and improve. So thank you, Rob, for being here. I really appreciate it. Awesome, Sean. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Accounting Automation. I hope you found it valuable. I help accounting firms scale their profit exponentially without needing to hire any additional accountants. So if your firm is in growth mode and can't keep up, I'd love to talk to you more about how I can empower your firm to do more with less through automation and technology. To learn more, visit my website, nextstep.io, or email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's sean, S-E-A-N, at nextstep, N-X-T-S-T-E-P.io.